On October 28, 1908, during an evening session in the House of Commons, a cry rang out from the ladies' gallery. Votes for women! Members of Parliament looked towards the gallery, though they could not see past the metal grill that hid female spectators from their sight. They would learn that the source of the commotion were members of the prominent suffrage organization, the Women's Freedom League. Protesters Helen Fox and Muriel Matters had chained themselves to the grill, so security could not easily remove them. We have listened behind this insulting grill too long. Stop talking about the licensing bill and get to the women's question, demanded one suffragette. We call upon the Liberal government to prove itself liberal, cried another. The parliamentary meeting continued despite the heckling. As the women shouted to the MPs, lecturing them on women's enfranchisement, other WFL members, both male and female, showered the commons in leaflets. Meanwhile, their compatriots protested outside Parliament. Fox and Matters refused to unchain themselves, and security had to remove the metal grill in order to escort the women from the building. Fourteen members of the WFL were arrested that evening. This was not the first form of aggressive protest that the suffrage movement saw, and it was far from the last. But the narrative it constructed, courageous women having to go to such extremes to be heard in Parliament before being dragged out, grabbed attention. For some suffragists, marches, rallies, and petitions were just not doing it. The cause needed to be taken to the next level. In addition to rallies and marches, the Women's Social and Political Union, as well as the WFL, encouraged its members to take aggressive action in the name of votes for women. The WSPU's slogan of deeds, not words, inspired varied and creative means of militant protest. Actress and suffragette Kitty Marion, frustrated by the government's treatment of her fellow activists, was advised by WSPU leader Christabel Pankhurst to break the windows of a Newcastle post office. In her memoirs, Marion describes the damaging of government property as a time-honored British argument on the part of the people, when the government fails to listen to verbal arguments and reason. This sentiment of tradition is echoed throughout suffrage pamphlets and literature. In a satirical letter to the editor of The Labour Leader, activist T.D. Benson wrote, When men wanted the franchise, they did not behave in the unruly manner of our feminine friends. They were perfectly constitutional in their agitation. In Bristol, I find they only burnt the mansion house, the custom house, the bishop's palace, the excise office, three prisons, four toll houses, and 42 private dwellings and warehouses, and all in the perfectly constitutional and respectable manner. Benson is referencing a riot in 1831, when a reform act granting greater representation to the working class areas of Britain was rejected by the House of Lords. Unlike the men in Benson's letter, suffragettes had hard limits when it came to destruction of property. No people or animals were to be harmed. Only empty or abandoned buildings were to be set on fire. When breaking windows, suffragettes were to make sure that no one inside the establishment would be hurt by falling glass. Of course, whether one kind of public destruction is moralistically better than the other is debatable, and militant tactics were divisive to say the least. Members of the public tended to look upon militant acts unfavorably, sometimes responding with violence. A meeting of the Lewisham branch of the WSPU was crashed by young medical students who, according to the Times, gathered in a corner, sang comic songs, shouted down the speakers, threw over ripe fruit, and blew trumpets. The WSPU did their best to continue their meeting, but the hecklers were too disruptive. It was only after the students destroyed the room that the police arrived. A brawl between the officers and raucous students ensued. Eventually, the young men were escorted from the meeting. This disruption garnered only one inch of column space in the Times. Militancy was as hotly debated within the suffrage movement as it was in the press. Some women believed that the WSPU and WFL's militancy did more harm than good isolating the very people that the constitutional organization, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, was trying to reach. Author and playwright Cecily Hamilton was a member of the WSPU for a few months, but never took part in any militancy. In her autobiography, she considers why. The more I thought about it, the more it seemed to be there was a lack of logic in the militant belief in violence. The acceptance of violence as the best means of obtaining political ends implies a secondary importance of the vote itself. Others, like the aforementioned Kitty Marion, saw militancy as a necessity, 
arguing that the actions taken by militants that were then covered by a, quote, abusive press, brought public attention to the movement in ways that constitutionalism could not. Debate over the effectiveness of militancy continues to this day, but one thing is certain. Militant actions, more often than not, led to prison.